En dit is dus Ira Cohen, de maker van deze film Kings with Straw Mats. Kwaliteit is zichtbaar van een jaar of twintig geleden. Het interview wat nu met hem volgt werd kort geleden opgenomen op Schiphol. Hij was in Nederland, vertrok naar New York en we praten met hem over zijn trip deze zomer naar Italië. Over kunst, over gedichten en over wat het eigenlijk allemaal betekent. Love your face. Last time you did all the star shit, so. Where's the stars? I have stars. Hello. Yeah, you like that? What? The underwear? Uh, uh, this is Humphrey Bogart speaking to you from uh, Schiphol. Listen, uh, did that plane come in with uh, that shit from Bombay? Huh? All right, well, just uh, if there's any problem, just uh, send Elizabeth Taylor over. She'll take care of it. <laughs> okay. You want me to take the hat off? Uh, Ira Cohen, poet, filmmaker, photographer. Someone who uh, has been popping in and out of Amsterdam for the past few years and, in fact, popping in and out of my life. And uh, Now, one of the things is I write a little bit of poetry, but... Compared to Ira, I don't know anything about poetry. And that's one of the things that amazes me. When I ask you, Ira, about a good poet, you always know who is a good or who's a bad. You were mentioning uh, a, a female poetress. Yeah. Well, just call me Pop. Oh, I call you Pop. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to start crackling soon. <laughs> no, no. Uh, but you were mentioning some... Yes, I was mentioning uh, Marina Tsvetaeva. Svetayev, I usually say, but sometimes I think I uh, don't uh, know the proper uh, emphasis in the Russian. Uh, so I was trying to get a book of her poems uh, in English published by Penguin and transla beautiful translations, which is important, especially with Russian poetry, I think, uh, for some reason, that they should be good. That's true of all translations, of course, but uh, the translations by Elaine Feinstein, I think that's her name, and a British woman poet, are really supremely good and carry the best quality of uh, Marina's poetry across. And she's one of the great poets of, uh, of our time, any time. How do you define, how do you recognize great poets? Well, I don't know, it's like, uh, did you ever kiss somebody and actually think that it was good? Was it smacklick? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then you know. Then you know, so I don't know. I mean, I could try to make it more Yeah, but like like if you go to school they they, they I feed don't you think about it it's like uh, it's just a direct if it's there it's there i mean i start reading something and i feel uh, that i'm taken somewhere i'm inspired i'm touched i'm transported and that's what poetry can do and that's why man cannot live by bread alone all that those clichés that's what that means uh, gregory corso said poetry is king and that's what he meant also because you can accomplish something in a poem that uh, people really uh, shouldn't live without even if they don't think they give a damn about poetry. And I know that uh, most people I speak to, including people who consider themselves educated, uh, uh, whatever their profession, but if I speak to them about poetry for one minute, I can simplify everything by just saying, asking them if, oh, by the way, uh, can you actually tell me the names of uh, three poets who were living on the planet Earth today, and uh, very few people can do that, except poets. You know, I don't know. So uh, poetry, in a way, poetry is... is... very important, but it still stays mysterious to most people. You just said poetry is king. The media industry now say content is king, or broadband is king. And with broad, broadband, which means... Broadband? Bro broadband. You know, which means full, full broadband. That means... That means A video with tridimensional sound, stuff like that. Uh, advertising will say that uh, Kleenex is king, isn't it? Or is that queen? No, I'm saying there's somebody saying what if they're selling something, then they say that that's uh, top of the line. King, queen, uh, you know, duke or earl, uh, it's just a question of yeah, sales. It's this opposition. It's a question of sales in the commercial world. As it happens, poetry is one of the few things uh, besides... Uh, Well, I don't know, uh, a, a serious priest, uh, you know, might have a vocation which he's doing, you know, it's uh, something he's doing not primarily 
because it's the most remunerative job he could get, you know, but poetry is holy in the same way, you know, and it hasn't got to do with money, so nobody is advertising, you know, poetry as a project, as a product, and... Uh, but would that mean that in the days of the internet, in the days of no, the... Uh, bullshit. I mean, there's nothing on the internet, and unless it happens to be a poem that escaped uh, from jail and landed on the internet by accident. There's a lot of information if you want to see where you can uh, get shoes sent to your home. Wait a minute, wait a minute, uh, Ira. You're, you have a website or you are on no, people's website? I don't website. have any website and I might have anything. I have money in my pocket, but I'm not committed to money. I, if I need it, I can use it. If I have it, I need it just like anyone else. But that's not my commitment and my commitment is not to the internet. My commitment is to uh, uh, you know, something else, to uh, say to poetry or to people, you know, or to exchange, to communication, to freedom, to a lot of things. So, uh, but does it help that someone... If the internet serves that purpose, that's great. I don't have time for uh, the internet. I'm willing to give people something to put on the internet because in a way it pleases me. I prefer one book to anything on the internet because I'm not interested in reading off screens. I like the smell of ink. I like the feel of a book. But uh, if there are people who can read that, you know, or, or download it off the net in Hong Kong that I never met, I probably have a better chance, you know, just like you can if you want to get a, uh, uh, you know, a, uh, what do they call it, uh, a, take away, a take out lunch or a take away bride, you know, by uh, mail, uh, you would be more lucky than if you uh, tried uh, going to uh, the bar on the street where you live, you know. So in that sense, if uh, a poem... Take away poet, uh, poem meet, uh, beats McDonald's? Uh, no, I'm saying that, uh, you know, uh, that the fact that you can reach people that you don't know and who don't know you, I mean, if these uh, poems on the net are actually bouncing out there in the ether, you know, the whole net system, and that uh, somebody in another galaxy can actually uh, suck down that information and start reading the poems in their language, you know, because they have a, a better chip in their brain than we carry, you know, in our computer, and they can read them, then that's delightful, like to reach people, you know, that you would never expect to reach or encounter, you know, in, uh, in real life, you know, in, in you know, human circumstances. Now, in, in real life, you just uh, completed a tour of Europe, you went to, you came to Amsterdam, you went to Italy, with uh, well, to you, I came to Amsterdam. Well, but you you went around and you well, you thanking you anyway because uh, you know you deserve. Uh, tell tell us a little bit about your trip with your colleagues in Italy and and what you did there. Well, uh, first I came to Amsterdam because uh, you had something to do with that, and I decided uh, first I couldn't have come because it was too early and I wasn't going to stay and you know hatch eggs in Amsterdam for three weeks in order to go on to Italy, it would break up everything I'm doing and what I'm doing in New York. But then the dates got closer and closer, so it seemed very reasonable. So I had the great pleasure of uh, joining many old friends in Rau Court at the Poetry Revels. They held to celebrate their 25th anniversary, you know, as a commune or a community of poetry and uh, freedom and fun, you know, which uh, Rau Court represents for me. And I see uh, many people whenever I come to Amsterdam that I don't even remember necessarily by name, but whose faces appear in my dreams, you know, uh, just the way they appear in uh, paintings uh, of uh, Rembrandt or Franz Hals, you know, in museums. But anyway, uh, it was nice to see so many people, to share the time with them, to listen to them, and to really be reading poetry as I always have in Amsterdam uh, to a wonderful audience of people who really care about it and can listen to someone read in English, that's astounding to me. And uh, it also, for me, represents something else very special because uh, I believe in the, in the Akashic message and in something I would call the Star Tribe. And I feel that Amsterdam is one of the true magic centers of the Star Tribe. And the consciousness is psychedelic in the truest sense. Uh, you know, I don't care, uh, fuck LSD. It's not the point, you know. I'm leery of leery where I was leery of leery even during the time that we were friends and uh, he said some very nice things about uh, my piece on Majun or Hashish Candy which was charming but the thing is uh, psychedelic means consciousness expanding and that's the aspect that I appreciate in Holland and especially uh, in my experience in Amsterdam 
and in uh, Raucourt, for example. Is it different from Italy where you went? Yeah, very different. It's not a place, uh, it's a, there there's, I don't know, I don't know Italy enough to make glib remarks and I love Italy and I love the Italians and they're much easier to be with than the Dutch, you know, but you have to eat a lot of pasta and uh, there's a lot of olive oil there which is very good for you and uh, the sun of Italy and all kinds of things. The people I loved, I didn't get to know people in the same way, but they're uh, probably better dancers and uh, not as complex or lunatic as uh, people in Holland, you know, but I find that as a, as, a, as a strange a clockwork orange as the Dutch, you know, can make, that uh, there's always uh, incredible surprises around the corner. As you know, you just had to pick me up at the airport and took me to see an old friend that I had never met before, who gave me something I had never tried before. You remember, you were laughing quite a bit. And uh, who had 25 rabbits uh, jumping around on his lawn. And you don't find those situations, uh, you know, too much. Walter Ramaker was the guy. We, we did an interview with him. But you were on a bus in Italy with uh, some old friends, uh, some colleague poets. Well, we don't know what we can call them, but there were a bunch of Americans on this tour. Who were there with you? Pullman, Pullman My Daisy, you know, as a play on Pull My Daisy, and we were on a Pullman bus. So uh, in Sardinia, uh, and also in Rome, uh, Alejandro Jodorowsky and Steve Lacey and Irene Aibi were featured performers. Steve and Irene left after Rome to join some other jazz festivals, and they're old friends of mine, and they're really great performers. Jodorowsky made the film El Topo and is quite famous, especially, I guess, in Paris and building a reputation more in Italy, publishing books there. And uh, I was actually called by Alejandro, it's not my rap about myself, uh, the man who découvert El Topo, which is true. I don't want to go into all the things I did to help Alejandro. I had no power, but I had power, you know, from a powerless place. And I couldn't have done that for myself, or I couldn't do it just for anybody, but the circumstances were right. So El Topo became an overnight success due to my efforts. And uh, I saw him again there, but we were not uh, on good terms for some years, and uh, he was a little sluggish on a human level to respond to me directly as a person. He said somewhere, he, well, I don't know, I don't want to get into all this other, who else was there? Then, uh, I don't know, it's, uh, I mean, you plied me with drink, you know, before this interview, I don't <laughs> know, I mean, I've had... No, no, but tell me, at the end of it, you did, you, you, you met a no, few no, no, uh, Nobel Prize yeah. uh, laureates? No, no. So, no, there were a lot of wonderful people on the bus. There was uh, Ed Sanders, uh, who was singing, how does it go? He was one of my heroes, which is a song about his guru, Allen Ginsberg. And then uh, there was Ann Waldman, who was with Allen in uh, Boulder at the Naropa you know, School of Disembodied poets, uh, uh, Poetry, doing some uh, very strong shamanic performances. Uh, uh, John Giorno, who was uh, wonderful, uh, doing uh, his special things and doing them half in Italian, funny because he is of Italian parentage and, uh, and his Italian is very New York, you know. How is it? You have been on the stage, on this tour, with people speaking Italian, with people speaking yeah. Greek. They're all doing poetry in their own language like well, you do. In this case it was mostly American with Italian translations. It was a little bit cumbersome to read because uh, only the poems that had been translated into Italian could be performed and then half the time had to be given for a live you know, per, uh, person to speak the poems, but it was all fine. Uh, Janine Pami Vega was one of the better poets. Marty Matz, a good friend from the Bronx, and of course uh, the uh, uh, remarkable Jack Hirschman and Agneta Falk, his wife, were also part. I might be leaving some other people out, but forgive me for leaving them anybody out. Everybody. Did you, did you have a feeling that the Italians like this kind of of I stage? Feel, uh, yeah, the Italians are very open. They were a very good audience. I didn't feel. They were necessarily the hippest audience. Uh, I mean, I think Amsterdam is uh, one of the hippest places. It's not a, 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 an accident that in my first days in contact with Simon Vinkenog and whatever, that we were writing to each other like, you know, Amsterdam Magic Center to Tangier Magic Center, you know, New York maybe Magic Center, I don't know. 
So, uh, you know... Do you feel these people share the old dream of the 60s and the 70s? Because you are still like a political poet. You, 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 you talk about the psychedelic... Well, there's a very strong left-wing thing in Italy. I actually helped change the drug laws in Italy through a whole complicated story I won't go into where I created a group called the Eternal Committee uh, you know, to uh, uh, set right an injustice about uh, people being arrested in a totally improper way. Some of those people were from the living theater, but other people from uh, Italian spaghetti, Western films, movie star, uh, and uh, beautiful girls all taken off in some way, and I did something which caused them to change the laws. This is many years ago. But I would say in Italy, people are very open, and some people are very nostalgic, and many people were coming up just like kids trying to get autographs, you know, uh, from movie stars. So, I mean, it's a mixed uh, bag in another way. And uh, then when uh, we finally got to Amalfi, part of the people, a number of the poets on that tour, myself included, uh, you know... Uh, Amalfi is, is a coastline. It's on the coast, uh, you know, southern coast of, uh, of Italy, very beautiful there. And we read in an exquisite old church in the museum, extension of that church, and uh, that we were joined by 12 other poets from different countries. So the, there was a certain group from Bosnia and Herzegovina, like, uh, is it uh, Surajlic, a 70-year-old beautiful poet who was up for the Nobel Prize uh, last year and uh, may get it next year or what, anyway, whatever. Prizes don't really mean a hell of a lot to me, though I wouldn't mind getting one, especially if it carries a stipend for the rest of my life and uh, maybe a free jacuzzi. Uh, you know, I'd like to work, I'd need to work out, so I'd like to have a ticket to swim someplace, you know, uh, near my house. No, but anyway, so uh, he was there. Is it Surajlic? Uh There were three Arab poets who came. Uh, there was uh, Jorge Enrique Adum, a wonderful uh, Chilean, I mean, not Chilean, uh, Ecuadorian poet who uh, was very close to Pablo Neruda as his assistant and companion. So I don't, there was a very good group of people. Some Italian poets, uh, 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 one poet from Sardinia who made a great performance, plus some good musicians. So that three days in Amalfi was beautiful because we weren't traveling. And uh, basically it was like being, uh, you know, a designated hitter. You know what that is? Yeah, in, baseball. in the baseball game. Yeah, yeah because uh, it's three days, and basically each person is reading 15 minutes, you know, in one of those three days. So you have a lot of time to, uh, you know, drink coffees in the cafes. Uh, Cafe Latte, nice. Uh, so you felt that there is a brotherhood of, of international yeah, poets? No, it was wonderful. We all came together in really wonderful spirit and shared something memorable. You know, it was easier to feel that kind of quality in the international grouping even than in the American group by itself, as I don't have to explain to you why. If you had 12 Dutch poets in a, a bag and you locked it up and then opened it up, you might see a few scratches on a few of them. But if you put in uh, 12 different animals, you'd be shocked to see that the kitten was l lying on the dog's head and the you know, octopus was kind of kissing the, uh, the porcupine, you know what I mean? <laughs> well, maybe Ira gave away the secret of organizing a great uh, poet tour is uh, don't put too many people of the same nationality, but let his international juices flow, the languages, the contact, and then still poetry is king. Yes, but I mean, I have a special uh, devotion to things like this Akashic message. And uh, you don't find just uh, because uh, poets are poets, some people may even be practicing Buddhists or be members of any religious uh, persuasion. But the question is, do they have the expanded consciousness view, you know, that is, uh, you know, uh, that is resting on the foundation of a tradition of great Sufi, you know, uh, marvels and uh, poetry and... Uh, and uh, saints, you know, and so forth and so on. And this is another side of my life, you know, because I spent uh, years in Morocco and in India, and as you know, the Kumbh Mela, the Nagas, and all of this stuff, uh, my own uh, Jewish uh, roots. I'm sure, Ira, that we, one of these days we'll show a little bit of your films again, your, your Kings with Straw Mats, uh, your other films that you made, your, your Mylar films. We spoke with Ira Cohen. Uh, on his you way. never know enough about me until we kiss. Oh, God. You can kiss me now? Oh. Well, I...
Ciao, 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 Trivanga. Having mastered the 84,000 asanas, he learns to slow down his heartbeat and to stop his breath at will. Using his own body as an astral platform, he goes from illumination to union. And on to samadhi, the object of which is nothing less than complete release and ultimately God absorption. Amrita Nand Giri, 86 year old master of yoga, demonstrates his prowess. Connecting the chakras, he performs an elegant finger dance, lifts himself off the ground on his hands, and makes his body a star mandala, the position of the unborn. He brings together sun and moon, holds his ego under his thumb. By purifying his semen, he becomes the embodiment of ritual sacrifice, making of his own body a very altar. Anything goes on the other side of the river. Neither this, neither that, but something else. That something for nothing, which walks the line too high to die. So we have the smoke here or? Yes. Very high, very hard compassion. For child time. I'm coming from Gujarat. Gujarat. Dakor. My name is Coconut Baba. Hari Hari Bol. Dakor Gujarat. I'm coming from Gujarat. God is one. God is great. God is light. God is kind. God is here. God is everywhere. Don't forget. God is one. Hare Krishna, Hare Out of it. Uh, bang, yeah. bang. But I mean, doesn't this have a good effect yeah. on the bronchioles, you know? If oh, yes, it has an effect on the bronchioles also, and it an energetic effect on the brain also. Uh -huh. And it brings you good sleep also. And what about potency, sexuality? Or? Oh, very nice, potential also. Uh -huh. Very good potential. The sadhus are taking a lot of this plant. Sadhus. Not only sadhus, even grasses also. Yes, everyone. Oh, yeah.
खाएंगे तेरे बाल का भजन करेंगे गोपाल का महाराज श्री गुरुदेव मुझा में तो और सा Third eye receives orange cable hookup. Just book me a room at the hotel. Relax. Here we see Kemanan Puri, another member of the Juna Akara, known to some of us as Kak Baba, doing the Linga Ke Kriya, an exercise practiced by most Nagas. This discipline involves stretching the penis, rolling it on a stick, twisting it around several times like an airplane propeller. Most Nagas are said to break a nerve in the penis as part of the initiation to render it incapable of erection. Okay, uh, the last thing I wrote in New York was uh, a line uh, that I said on the telephone to a friend saying, uh, nobody ever committed suicide on my watch. I said that to Susanna Sedgwick on the telephone. Anyway, that was the day of the Mermaid Festival. But a few days later, I was in uh, Amsterdam. And then when I was leaving, it was July 7th, 2000, and I wrote this poem on my last night here called, Don't Smoke in Bed. What is it makes me wake through the Amsterdam night? My things strewn all around me, poems and photos all in a litter, dreams forever unfulfilled. I read Bone Whistle on the Peter Hofstrat on the Dalai Lama's 65th birthday. And yes, he was here at Madame Tussauds Wax Museum, along with Picasso and Elizabeth Taylor, awaiting another onslaught of tourists. Now they call it Masterdam. Everyone jockeying for position, the remnants of the Star Tribe hold their revels in Raucourt, old friends holding to their stations in a storm of cancer and Drempel Frace, while the holy men light fires in the dark night. Teo listens to a Chopin nocturne and gives his work away with a gentle smile. Simone and Edith feeding birds in their garden from their own plates. Harry High Street fills rusty film cans with water to reflect the light from above, arranges penguins in water-stained books, paints frescoes on walls marked for destruction, and I snip and snap, an autistic giraffe longing for styrofoam gardens. Oh, Lakshmi, stay the course. Be my beacon of light. My wires are crossed, and I order a Coca-Cola Caliente because my giraffe is thirsty. It is almost 6 a.m., and I am on the Nua Octogracht, 
listening to the Cantorell rooster calling out the dawn. I order a mirror for the twin who has lost his brother. I try to open my heart to let all the spirits in. I try to disperse the clouds of ignorance, the little human treacheries. I thank you for your beauty, bowing down in a field of sheep. I celebrate your celebration of life. I submit to my destiny and ponder the meaning of this eternal bundle under stars, this harbor without outlet, this flame in our hearts. And by this flame, I mean that flame no launch, larger than a thumb, which exists in every living being, as discussed by the Vedas. So, that's it. And one other little poem I'll give you as long as you're taping, because it's a charming little poem I wrote when I was on the tour, when a certain little moment occurred. It's called, Lawrence Ferlinghetti Takes Off His Hat for Lakshmi in Castilian Cello. Here we are, just us two, in the crowd. I look for you. Here at the Sopravento, the setting sun sets your hair ablaze. And now in these waning days, I bless your brim. The poet crowns you with his cap. Your poise, your grace, captivate him. All right, I'm going to read you one more poem because uh, Luke is paying the bill and... Uh, this is called Sahara Bound. There is nothing in this cage but wind, Hafiz. Waking up at Paul and Susan's on Bank Street, I dreamed of Isabel Eberhardt, who said to me, although I am not a big talker, I am a big smoker. Lying under the pomegranate trees in the oasis of Chinini and Gabes, do you remember the sun's rays bouncing off the salted chot in southern Tunisia? We both saw the same mirage, and then you were gone. All I remember is a caravan of strange trees by full moon on the road to Matmata. Leaving the oasis at 3 a.m., we started walking in the direction of the Sahara. Isabel Eberhardt, you know, was an 18-year-old girl who went to, from Switzerland to Algeria, took on men's clothes, became a Muslim you know, uh, and died in a flash flood in the Sahara at the age of 27. One of the most remarkable uh, people I know. My favorite outlaw of the spirit, in fact. So, they're getting a little excited here. Yes. Poetry gets people really excited, you know what I mean? So, maybe we should read another one just since they're so interested. Yeah, yeah this is good. This, this one, no, this will take it full circle. This is a poem for a good friend of mine, Roxanne, a great Indian dancer, an American woman, Roxanne Dasgupta, and also for Marina Tsvetayeva, the Russian woman poet I spoke of. I put them together as dedicatees of this poem. Awake in a dark room alone, downstairs the goddess of love sleeps, her jewels and makeup in a box till the next performance. Memory dances in the net of illusion, Mahamaya, and I, unable to sleep, feel myself less substantial, turning into a memory. Perhaps it is better to have the heart of a jackal. I would not come again to lie in a cradle or to know the short weight of earthly love. Asha Pasha Vinir Mukta, freed from the fetters of hope. Thanks. This is for Ganesh Baba and Barry, who was buried uh, two days ago.